welcome to you, brothers and sisters, as you gather in your homes and we gather with family to observe Maundy Thursday of our Holy Week. Traditionally, we would be having Lord's Supper and celebrating the sacrament, of course, focusing on that. Uh, we'll be able to do that again once we're able to come back together and celebrate it uh, again. And maybe it'll help us appreciate that blessing that God has given to uh, it as given to us uh, when we do. Until then, it gives us the opportunity tonight to focus on some of the other events that happened on Maundy Thursday evening. And as we developed our theme through Lent, we continued to develop it in understanding how our Savior fought for us, winning for us salvation. And tonight we understand that as we view one of the events from the Garden of Gethsemane. And understanding how the, the battle that he was fighting was also one that was personal to him and to us. We'll have a service uh, as we'll be leading along. And so we are delighted to hear a hymn, uh, a supplement hymn 717. It will have three stanzas and it will be led by our duet. <laughs> In the name of God, to whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hidden. Amen. We confess our sins. O Lord, Lord hear, hear my, my prayer. prayer. Listen, Listen to my cry for mercy. And in, in your, your faithfulness, faithfulness come, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment. For no one living is righteous before you. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, Confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me, and I am deeply sorry for them.
Jesus says to his people, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, Yes, I I believe. believe. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty God, Grant that we who deserve to be afflicted for our evil deeds may mercifully be relieved by the comfort of your grace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. My friends, our devotion this evening focuses upon one of the events that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. We focus on that event where Judas came with soldiers and betrayed our Lord. From Luke chapter 22, verses 47 through 48, we hear, While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man? With a kiss? This is the word of our Lord. My friends, have you ever received one of those official looking emails that comes in and it looks like it's from your bank? It looks like it's from somewhere that you trust. Maybe you have an account somewhere. And you get an email and it has this attachment and they want to confirm something, whether it be you who made a change or whether it be something they just say, I want to confirm that this is who you are and this is what you're doing. You notice maybe that that's some sort of spam, that it is something that may not be authentic. It may not be real or genuine. And maybe you have your suspicions. But if you haven't and you've been caught in it before, maybe you've noticed you hit that attachment and all of a sudden, there's a pop-up or something starts to load on your, your computer or your phone and they start acting funny because you've just downloaded a virus of sorts. That is called a, that kind of program is called a Trojan horse. And it gets its name from the Trojan War where the Greeks in the city of Troy were at war and the Greeks came up with this ingenious idea to make this Trojan horse and leave it at the gates of the city of Troy. And when the Greeks left The Trojans thought they had outlasted them. And so they brought this trophy that was this Trojan horse into their gates, locking them behind him, not knowing that inside of that Trojan horse there were Greek soldiers who would open those gates for the city and of course the city of Troy would be overcome and it fell to the Greeks. Our text is a tragic case of one of the twelve of those who had been called called to walk those dusty roads in Israel, someone who had heard the word of God directly from God's mouth, someone who had heard of the miracles, seen them with his own eyes, someone who had been there to hear the sermon, someone who had been there not only to see gifts of healing and, and, and special things that Jesus was able to do, but someone also called to be a part of a ministry, even doing mission work in the name of our Lord. But this man became a betrayer. We know that sin and, of course, the devil had inserted, if you will, a Trojan horse into the heart of Judas that everything he did at that point was to betray our Lord into the hands of his enemies. As we examine the event of that happening in the Garden of Gethsemane, we realize how important it is for our Lord who is our warrior, as we've talked about in this season of Lent, to be someone who not only fights for us, but who helps us in our battles, our daily battles against sin, and of course, the devil, who would love to have us go against our God, go against our Savior, and of course, ruin our faith in him. We realize that the battle Jesus is fighting for us is one that is personal, personal to him as well as personal to you and to me. At night, we can lock our doors 
and we can keep thieves out and try to keep robbers from taking our things. Maybe you can set up on your computer or phone a firewall, something that will protect you from those kinds of, of viruses, those Trojans, horses that can come in. But we also know that not everything on the outside is where we find trouble. And we see that in the example of Judas of our text this evening. He was fighting a battle, a battle that was very personable, and we know that feeling, something that's with inside of us, something that comes from deep in our hearts. It was right after Jesus and his disciples had left that upper room, after they had gone away from that upper room to the Mount of Olives, and there uh, at the base of the Mount of Olives was the Garden of Gethsemane. And there they had gone, and you, maybe you remember the history. They had gone, and Jesus was praying, praying that his heavenly Father would take away the things that he had in store. Not because he was unwilling, but because it was going to be hard for him. He knew what it would be to suffer. He knew it was going to mean his death. He was willing to do it. But he also prayed to his heavenly Father for the strength that he needed to carry on and endure. And maybe you remember those few times where between the disciples and he coming back and forth, finding them sleeping. It's after that last time he comes up finding them sleeping once again and is waking them that we get to hear. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up. Matthew tells us that Judas came up to Jesus went and singled him out for the soldiers by dramatically placing a kiss on his cheek. Perhaps to some it looked like Judas was just doing what was common cultural practice when he would introduce himself to a friend once again to give him a kiss on the cheek and then on the other. But to Judas, to those soldiers, to Jesus, they knew exactly what it meant. He was betraying his Savior, his Lord, into the hands of his enemies. Jesus even gives Judas a few opportunities to really think about what he's doing. He, he calls him by name, maybe something he had done hundreds and thousands of times before. He says, Judas, Judas. Matthew mentions that finally Jesus said, do what you came for, friend. What had turned Jesus, Judas from someone who was a friend of this group of 12, someone who was a friend of Jesus, into someone who would betray him. What Trojan horse was implemented, was put in place, had found a, a place inside the entrance of his heart that would make him a traitor to the ranks of the 12 who had been called to follow him and who had spent the last three years in the ministry of our Lord. Well, maybe you remember the details. Judas was someone who had constantly fall to the temptation of stealing. He was the treasurer for the group. He helped himself to the money, we're told. It's that temptation that maybe led him to see things as, as Jesus' ministry was coming to its end. That when Jesus talked about suffering and dying, he may not have wanted that. He would look for an opportunity to benefit. And so it was Satan who planted that little bit of, a, of an idea. Maybe he could go and he would profit by going to the chief priests and handing his Lord over for those 30 pieces of silver. We also know that it was Jesus who had addressed the whole group and told them one of them was going to betray him to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy. And during the Last Supper, we hear those terrible words yet again. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. It's obvious by what we get to hear that Judas was struggling. Maybe in the same way you understand struggles. He struggled internally. He struggled in his heart, especially at the end. Satan had gained control of his heart, had gained control of that thing that motivated him and committed him, and committed him to committing this sin that maybe you might consider the worst of all who call themselves a disciple to betray their Lord over to his enemies. Can you think of a, a worse or sadder legacy than that of Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve who would betray his Lord? Think of 
what that name implies. If you call someone Judas, or if you would imply it, I don't think many would name their child after Judas Iscariot, knowing the overtones of what it means. The battle against Satan is a personal one. One that Judas was dealing with. One that his disciples were dealing with as well. He warned all of them that they would walk away from him. They would desert him. On that same night, Jesus had warned them after they had received the Lord's Supper that they, and went out into the Garden of Gethsemane. He warned them, you're all going to walk away. They refused. If you remember, even Peter, he warned explicitly You're going to disown me three times before the rooster crows. And of course, Peter said, no, I would never do something like that. And yet, he failed too. The Trojan horse being the fear of his heart, that he would be discovered, that he too would be brought before that council like Jesus, that he too would suffer such a fate. It made him also turn against Jesus. We know this struggle, don't we? It's a struggle that's within us as well. I think about that as I I look at my own life and I wonder, what will be the Trojan horse that the devil uses to try to convince this heart? Or your heart? Just like Peter. Just like Paul, who also spoke of the struggle that goes on inside of us each and every day in his letter to the Romans. He talked about trusting Jesus with all his heart, but he finds that there's another force working inside of him. His faith is under attack, and his sinful flesh, it's weak. And so is yours. It can be many different things. Sometimes there's guilt over things you've done in the past, and you maybe feel unworthy of the forgiveness that Jesus came to win for us. Maybe it's something that's physical right now. You find yourself drawn and pulled in and trapped in some sort of physical addiction. And so you wonder, how can you get out? How will you be strengthened to overcome this struggle? Maybe it's, it's something else completely. You live with disappointment, not just maybe in somebody, but in yourself. And you wonder, how can you go on? There's works of depression working in your mind. And you wonder, how can you overcome Then again, maybe it's losing your cheerful spirit and not only in your service to your Lord, but also in your giving to him. Maybe you are spiritually getting lazy, finding less and less time to worship with your Lord, to spend time studying his word for yourself, to spend time even in a prayer life. We have plans for everything, but what about our plans with our Lord? Do you see the Trojan horses that are put before us and planted in? Sometimes we fall to them so very quickly. And as other times it feels like we struggle each and every day just to overcome the smallest of things. But we have help. And that's the point that we get to see. We have help. Not only do we have help, we have this wonderful news that our warrior came to fight these battles on our behalf. Jesus is the defense we have against our sinful flesh and against Satan who would try to make us uh, fight against our Lord. He's the one who would never betray us. He's the one who was betrayed because we needed him to be for us. He went through all of that physical abuse that would come on Good Friday all by himself. Alone, he carried our sins on his shoulders before the judgment of God suffering the pains of hell itself in our place with the prize, the prize of his sight earning full forgiveness for every sin that we've ever committed. And when Jesus voluntarily gave up his life on the cross, every sin that we've ever committed, every charge against us was declared paid in full. Your sins, my sins, the sins of of the whole world. When God looks at us, he sees his perfect Savior. Something that's available to every one of us. For all who turn to him in faith, he guarantees this same wonderful justification. But Jesus, you understand, is not the end. He is but the beginning of our personal battle 
with Satan and with our weak flesh. He is the one who comes to us and supports us in our, in our faith as well as in our struggle against those daily things that we deal with. We needed this warrior to come on our behalf to help us in our active battle against sin. And he has given us weapons for this personal struggle against Satan and the sin within us to help us grow in our faith, to help us become more like him, to brighten our vision of what will be for us one day, to make us more bold in our lives in proclaiming what he's done and even enlarge the daily joy that we already have in him. Realize what those gifts are, my friends. First of all, there are his word and the precious promises that he gives to us in it. His word is described as that two-edged sword. With one edge, it, it reveals everything that we do that is not perfect and holy. And, and of course, the other side, it cuts away the guilt that would be ours had not Jesus came and saved us. It puts our Savior into sharper focus. God's word makes our faith stronger and it even alerts us to the ways in which the devil would like to come and tempt us. The way he tries to implant his, his viruses that want to destroy us. It is both an offensive and it's a defensive weapon. Secondly, our warrior provides for us personally in his sacrament that he gives to us. We'll get to celebrate that again, I hope, very soon. It's as close as possibly we can get to him this side of heaven. It's as if we're in the upper room with the disciples as Jesus passes around that bread and that wine and tells them of what it means for them because it brings to us the forgiveness that we need, the new life that is ours, Eternal life, salvation that he promises to us in it, that he's battled to win for us. My battle against Satan is personal. So personal that Jesus personally comes to us in bread and wine with his body and blood to strengthen us. And lastly, right now the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts, through the gospel that he proclaims in his word to strengthen us for the battle that is ours each and every day. We are receiving the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's what we get to hear, it's what we get to focus on, and it's something that is personal to us. Not just personal to us, but personal for others around us. Together, when we get to encourage each other, we are to be encouragers of all of each other. And maybe that's something that we're missing a lot right now, being separated. But what better way than to care for each other than to make sure we are in contact. Contacting each other and supporting each other, showing love for one another. And what a day it will be when we get to come back together and celebrate all in one place the wonder fellowship that we share because of our Lord and his word. All of this so that our faith might grow, that it might be strengthened and nourished by the rich grace of God in his word and sacrament. My friends, the Lord has given you the proper means by which to struggle each day and know that you will overcome. You may fall to things, but I want you to remember that you may fall to your battles, but the victory for sure is yours already. So hear the encouragement of Paul as he encouraged us. He said, Put on the full armor of God that every, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Fellow loved believers and fully equipped soldiers of Christ, let me encourage you with one word, forward. Because that's how we live. That's how we know our, our struggle will not end, but one day it will. In the glories of heaven, we move forward until that day, looking at our Savior, looking to him and him alone, and knowing he has overcome. In his name we are thankful. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll now take a few minutes 
to consider our commitments to our Lord. It'd be an opportune time uh, to be able to give your offerings online or uh, consider uh, the other ways in which you can support your Lord's ministry. My friends, as we prepare our hearts and minds also to pray to our Lord, the prayer of the church, we remember those who need our prayers as well. For David Hauk and Leona Klup, who will both be having surgery, so, surgery soon. For Marvin Cock, John Kenyon, and Heather Falk, who've been treated and are in different stages of recovery. We're going to ask the Lord to continue with that. For Jim Hammond, he's a cousin to the Kling family. He's in the hospital due to the coronavirus, so we're going to ask that the Lord would bring about healing and recovery for him. For Janet Schaefer, uh, some patients as she is in hospice care. For the family of George Timmons, that is son-in-law of Lillian Hasse, um, as he has gone to be with his Lord, as well as for those who are working hard at this time to not only provide protection, but also health care for everybody as these are some different and trying times. Almighty God, your dear Son did not ascend to joy until he first suffered pain and did not enter into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it as the true way of life and peace through Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, protect David Hauk and Leono Klub and bring them favorable outcomes, if it be your will with the surgeries they have upcoming. Give patience also to their families as they look forward to hopeful recovery. We also ask that you comfort uh, Marvin Cook, John Kenyon, and Heather Follick as you will. They are in thankful for their treatments received, and we ask that you would continue to provide health and healing with the power of your almighty hand. We pray for Jim Hammond. Lord, keep Jim safe and keep, give peace to the Kling family as they encourage and support Jim through this trying time. We also ask a rich measure of patience for Janet Schaefer and her family as she endures through hospice. Reassure her of your gospel and its precious truths, that the life that your wonderful gospel has given to her is one that she looks forward to and is strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Give her the wonderful joy of looking forward to her heavenly home. We also ask comfort and peace to the Hasi family as Lillian's son-in-law has now been called to your side. Reassure them with the love of your promises and a glorious reunion one day with you. We also, Lord, ask that you keep your protecting hand on our essential workers in our community, especially law enforcement and health care and the food retail industries. We know that they are working hard to provide for everyone at this time. Of course, all those things also come only from your hands, and so we are eternally thankful then to you. We ask all these things, in the name of you who only can give all them perfectly to us, as we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessing, honor, thanksgiving, and praise, more than we can utter or understand, be to you, O holy and glorious Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by all angels, all mankind, and all creatures forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We now have opportunity to join in our closing hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. I'm glad for you if you've been able to join us and continue, I hope, to join us in online worship as we are able to uh, not just have these words of God before us, but learn from them, be emboldened by them, and of course be strengthened in faith by them. Uh, you can continue to hear and see those online services as they become available in the next number of days. Uh, we're also posting Bible classes that you can partake of and learn from and use for your personal study. So if you go onto our website and look under those, the right tab, you'll find those Bible studies posted there for you. And I'd encourage you to continue to uh, worship online and, of course, uh, view these things during our celebration of Holy Week. I also want to remind you to show love and, con and concern and care for your brothers and sisters in Christ, our family of faith. Uh, not just here at St. Paul's, but those in your life as well who need to hear of the wonderful assurances God gives to us in his word, the way he comforts us and the peace that he gives to us. Um, if you want, it be an opportunity for you to, to take that extra time, just call someone to uh, send them an email, send them a text, even write them and send it out in the mail. All opportunities for us to make contact and, of course, build relationships and show our love for one another. Your kind voice may be um, the blessing that someone needs and the encouragement that they would love to hear uh, today. So take the opportunity to show love for your brothers and sisters in that way. And also remember that uh, we still are collecting offerings and your support here at St. Paul's for our continued ministry. You can do that in the ways of sending in uh, your offering envelopes. You can drop them off. Uh, we're, we're here mostly every day. Um, there's a place where you can drop those off if you want to call and make an appointment. That's fine. Or you can use the online giving opportunity that we have 
I think for those who are using it, it's become a, a wonderful blessing to know that they can still support the ministry here. And I thank you for all those who have been doing that. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, of course, our church appreciates it. And what a wonderful blessing it will be when we're able to come back together and celebrate it again. Blessings to you uh, this day, and I look forward to seeing you and, and worshiping with you soon.